It's six o'clock, and now from TV8, where news is number one, Paul Rose, Kevin Cooney, Connie McBurney with weather, and Pete Taylor Sports. This is TV8 News, live at six. Good evening. Students may someday be able to choose where they go to public school. The Iowa legislature is looking at a proposal for open enrollment. Under that plan, students could transfer out of their home attendance areas into any school district anywhere in the state. Open enrollment has become an issue of interest in many states, and TV8's Chris Lidstad reports the governor of Minnesota today brought his state's experience to Iowa. Minnesota put open enrollment into effect only last year, but Governor Rudy Perpich came to Des Moines to spread the good news. This program was an immediate success. Minnesota calls their open enrollment plan the Choice Program. Students can leave one district and attend school in another for any reason. Try to find two triangles that they're comparing here. Here in Iowa, the prospect of such a program concerns some school administrators. They feel threatened because when a student transfers, state aid money for that student leaves the district too. Many school officials fear greater inequities between districts would result. The rich get rich and the poor get poor. We aren't in a profit and loss situation. I can't imagine us going out in terms of doing some ad campaigns and this type of thing, trying to generate students. But Minnesota's governor says all the concern is needless. The point is, by expanding choices and opportunities for students, we have improved the overall quality of the systems so that students benefit regardless of whether or not they exercise their choice options. Iowa lawmakers aren't likely to change their votes because of Perpich's comments but his visit was to some extent effective. It was somewhat reassuring that the governor showed that a lot of things that are really causing a lot of fears in here uh, don't seem to be happening in the initial stages of the implementation scheme anyhow. Still, school administrators say open enrollment is one more major change at a time when Iowa education is struggling to implement new standards and to develop a new aid formula. They say it's just too much. The House Education Committee will vote on the open enrollment bill next week. A number of changes from the Senate version are assured but the measure is expected to pass out of committee. Passage is not so certain once the bill reaches the House floor. In Bondurant, Chris Lidstad, TV8 News. A visit to Iowa by Minnesota's governor fuels speculation that he is thinking about a future run for president. TV cameras and reporters from Minneapolis followed Perpich here to ask him that very question. He told them he's very happy being governor is not starting a presidential campaign. After Sharp jumps in tuition at Iowa's three state universities, an Iowa House committee voted today to limit those increases. The House Education Committee approved a bill that would limit tuition hikes to no more than the inflation rate. On another matter, the overall House voted today to send that Iowa minimum wage bill to a joint conference committee with the Iowa Senate. Both houses want to raise the minimum wage to $4.65 an hour, but the Senate wants to exempt certain workers. The House does not. An Otumbo man died this afternoon when his truck came in contact with overhead power lines in Redfield. The name of the 26-year-old man has not been released pending notification of relatives. Cargill elevator operator Bud Hike said the truck driver was unloading some coal dust from his truck when the raised trailer portion hit the power line. The man was airlifted to a Des Moines hospital where he died. Hike said drivers routinely empty their trucks before picking up loads of grain. He said the driver apparently didn't know the power lines were in the way and a blocked chimney caused the deaths of a Pella couple. Merle and Mary Lou Stinas were found dead in their home of carbon monoxide poisoning. A farmhand found the bodies. Authorities said the toxic gases apparently came from a wood-burning stove. Some Ames business owners say they may take the state to court over a residential correction center that's being built in their downtown. They don't want the facility there, and they say they will not give up their fight until something is done. tv Sue Mason reports from Ames. The Ames Residential Correction Center is expected to be completed June 1st. It's one of 16 such facilities in the state. Of those, half are located in downtown commercial areas. But some Ames business owners don't want the center added to their neighborhood. The first thing it'll do is take a nice piece of concentrated commercial property and turn it into a residence as opposed to being able to utilize it for the commercial interests that were intended to be utilized at that location. I think there are much better locations that uh, this group of people can work into the community more often. They can be accepted by the community. The center will house 30 offenders who will be making the transition from prison to parole. They'll be living at the center and working in the community. Linda Merkin from the Department of Corrections says a similar center has been located in Ames for 10 years with no problems. 
she says a new facility is now badly needed. What we were trying to do with this location is get the offenders in reasonable proximity to the services that they need to reintegrate themselves into the community. The protesters say those who will be housed here are also being set up for temptation because the center is located within walking distance of bars and adult bookstores. But Linda Merkin says if someone wants to go to a bar, they're not far from one anywhere in Ames. Business owners also think the state is paying too much for the center. The state has a lease agreement and plans to buy the facility in 10 years at a purchase price of $555,000. Ames Mayor Pro Tem Larry Curtis says the state has met all requirements needed to go ahead with the project. Even so, business owners say they will continue their fight in court. In Ames, Sue Mason, TV8 News. Premium Standard Farms today filed an appeal for a permit to construct two sewage lagoons on its controversial hog lot in Boone County. Last week, the State Department of Natural Resources had denied the permit, putting the project on hold. The hog lot had stirred up a lot of controversy in Boone County, opponents claiming the smell would drive park goers away from Ledges State Park because of its close proximity. Still ahead on TVA News, the field is set in the race for a seat on the Des Moines City Council. And Prairie Meadows selects its first music man. Six candidates have filed nomination papers for a seat on the Des Moines City Council. Willie Glanton was the last candidate to officially file today at the city clerk's office. Glanton joined Nan Bailey, Lauren Essie, David Neff, Jack Nicodemus, and Thomas Velasquez, who all had filed earlier. Alfredo Alvarez had also taken out nomination papers, but did not return them by the 5 p.m. deadline. The election will be to replace Elaine Zamoniak, who is now serving in the state legislature. High cholesterol is a major contributor to heart disease, the nation's leading killer. And many of us are watching just what we eat so we can cut down on our cholesterol. But there are some important do's and don'ts when it comes to eating for a healthy heart. TVH Allison Gilman is here with more in her Heartbeat Special Reports. Allison? Kevin, cholesterol comes from two sources. Our bodies produce it and we get it from the foods we eat, which is why it's important mm -hmm. to eat healthy foods. There are plenty of trends, some might call them fads, in eating the so-called right foods. But like anything else, you should use common sense and moderation. Oat bran is one of the biggest winners in the search for foods to lower our cholesterol. It's the hottest food around right now, and we're seeing a boom in the number of products containing oat bran out on store shelves, where they sell out almost instantly. In fact, some stores have trouble keeping oat bran products in stock. See the raisins? Yeah, 29-year-old Carla Richards of Des Moines uses oat bran in her baking to help her family eat for healthy hearts. Well, as long as they, uh, the research on it, you know, says it's good for you, I'm going to use it. Along with a low-fat type of diet, the cholesterol can be decreased anywhere from 15 to 25 percent. Another big selling point with oat bran is that eating large amounts won't hurt you, unlike other substances people take to counter their high cholesterol. The recent bestseller, The Eight-Week Cholesterol Cure, out in local bookstores, advises readers to take niacin, a vitamin B derivative, to lower their high cholesterol. But this over-the-counter substance can be toxic if too much is taken. Des Moines cardiologists are already seeing some cases of niacin toxicity. Patients usually present with abdominal pain, uh, bloating, nausea and vomiting, and um, occasionally low blood pressure and dizziness, uh, and rarely even shock. Dr. Wickemeyer says niacin has been an effective tool to lower high cholesterol for about 20 years. But he says people should talk to their doctors before taking niacin to get the proper dosage, because too much niacin can hurt rather than help your health. Most Central Iowa hospitals and medical clinics are offering special, low-cost cholesterol screenings this week through Saturday in conjunction with Health Beat. A simple blood cholesterol test is $5. A more complete lipid profile is $10, and you must fast 12 hours before that test. Kevin, if you have any questions, you should call your local hospital. And let uh -huh. me tell you, Carla makes a good oat bran muffin. I <laughs> it's sampled a few of them. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks, Allison. Yeah, well, Racing Commission today heard the news. They've been waiting years to hear Prairie Meadows Racetrack will open on schedule. And horse racing will finally be off and running here in central Iowa. Prairie Meadows representatives told the commission that opening day at the track has been sold out. And only 7,000 tickets remain for the entire opening week. An open house at the track is now scheduled for Sunday, February 26th, and it will include exhibition racing. Also at the meeting today, Commission Chairman Bud Pike denied reports that drugs are a problem in Iowa's racing programs. Pike says drugs have been detected in only one half of one percent of the greyhounds racing in Iowa. 
says the commission will continue to work to keep racing in Iowa drug-free. Inland Prairie Meadows opens March 1st for its first race. Fans in the grandstand will hear the traditional call to post performed by the track's new official bugler. He is Dave Naughton of Ames. dozen other applicants who tried out for the position Tuesday night. Naughton attends Iowa State University. He's enrolled in the honors program there in music education. The new bugler will be paid $50 a day for playing the call to post before the start of each race. Uh, Kenny, were you really sick or just staying home because it was cold? Uh, no, I just didn't want to have anything to do with all that snow. I do have some <laughs> advice though. When this year's flu comes around, my advice is uh, give it a pass and wait for next year. Maybe that'll be a nicer one. You might want to give this weekend a pass, too, because what's coming our way originated in the Arctic. That's a hint about the forecast the weather's next. For the latest official forecast, 24 hours a day, call TV8 Weather, 262-7173. Had a little sunshine to look at today. Look at those blue skies. Nice day to spend some time outdoors. Melted some of that snow, too, although things are cooling off right now. It's down to 21 degrees with a wind chill of 7. Wind from the east at 9, 54% the relative humidity. And barometer falling at 30.85. Temperatures will be falling uh, the next 24 hours. We're going to see some changes, but uh, it's not too bad at this hour. Much of the state is still in the 20s. There is some warmer air right ahead of an approaching weather system to the west. Actually, we're a kind of on a convergence point. We're about to see weather systems move in from all directions. Late this afternoon, we reached a high of 24 here in Des Moines, leaving us below normal. And it'll be a while probably before we're back up above normal. Central Iowa in the lower 20s by late this afternoon. And you can see a couple of things going on. One, this rainy, persistent rainy system across the south. They've had 10 inches of rain here since the weekend in Kentucky, where serious flooding continues today. Heavy rains also across Texas. And right out here, a weather system coming in from the Pacific that's not particularly cold, but does have some snow with it. This is how things look late this morning, and here's how things are moving. This is coming up from the south. Snow has been moving in from the west. It's now snowing in much of South Dakota. The other factor coming in from the north, Arctic air. That's going to be settling over the northern states in the next 24 hours. It's evident already right up here along the Canadian border. Winter storm warnings are out from eastern Washington all the way into western Montana. Snow is scattered from that point east. Snow advisories out for Oregon, as this is turning out to be kind of a stinker of a system. And uh, I mentioned the cold temperatures. Take a look at these. By late today, much of the Canadian border area was below normal, below zero, rather. And from that point on, you can see temperatures beginning to drop. This is Rapid City already at 12, 9 up in the uh, Twin Cities. And we're about to see uh, a big decrease in these numbers, too. So a storm watch over here in the west or in the central eastern states this cold weather is about to plunge in there and meet all that precipitation. That's going to bring some snow to the Appalachians by late tonight. We could see some flurries in the northern part of the state. Very likely that we will see some of that tonight with winds from the east, lows above zero, but not very far. And by tomorrow, it should be light snow for most of us. Cloudy skies, winds becoming northeasterly. About the only significant accumulation up here in the northwestern corner, and they could see up to an inch, although probably less than that. Here's how things look for central Iowa tonight. Clear to partly cloudy, a low near 10 above. Wind from the east at 5 to 10 miles an hour. By tomorrow, mostly cloudy with a 30% chance of light snow and winds becoming east to northeasterly at 10 to 20. Friday night, a low near 10 with a chance of light snow. And Saturday's highs, 15 to 20 degrees with partly cloudy skies. The extended outlook, we have another chance for snow on Sunday and Monday, just in case you're disappointed in the chances tomorrow. Highs in the 20s to lower 30s, lows in the single digits to the teens, and that would leave us uh, a bit below normal even for this time of year. 21 degrees at 6 o'clock. Welcome back, Penny. Thanks. Donald Call says, coming back to the Des Moines Register is like putting on a comfortable pair of shoes. Call is resuming his over-the-coffee column after a four-and-a-half-year absence. He told TVH Mary Brubaker today he really hasn't had a chance to think about all the subjects he wants to write about in the column. Well, you know, I've made my living for the past 25 years writing a daily column, and one thing you learn is you don't look too far back and you don't look too far ahead. The main thing you're worried about, to me, the future is Thursday. You know, that's, yeah. that's about as far as I can uh, I can look. So I'm always concentrated on the next uh, uh, column, whatever uh, it is. Paul's first column appears in March. He'll continue living in Washington, D.C., but coming to Iowa about once a month. An eight-year-old Spencer, Iowa girl, will spend the next year representing those who are fighting muscular dystrophy. 
today. Julie Knight was initiated as the 1989 state poster child. Knight met with Governor Branstead and received the official poster child badge. Thank you. Knight will be involved with numerous state okay. MDA activities. The MDA telethon, of course, seen as it always is here on TV8 over the Labor Day weekend. And Pete Taylor is here now with more million dollar men in baseball. Makes you wish you could throw a fastball 100 miles an hour, Yeah, it? or 110. <laughs> That's right. Up they went today as far as salaries in baseball were concerned. We'll tell you about that and all the other sports right after these messages. Turns out that Roger Clemens was the highest paid player in baseball history for one day only. That's because today Oral Hirschheiser and the Dodgers reached agreement on a three-year contract calling for $7.9 million. Clemens signed yesterday for a mere $7.5 million. Meanwhile, the Cincinnati Reds and Eric Davis patched up their differences today. Davis got together with Reds owner Marge Schott to announce he has signed a one-year contract for $1.7 million. Great basketball team will be trying to snap a four-game losing streak tonight. Bulldogs are on the road at Illinois State. The two teams are tied for sixth place in the conference, and the Bulldogs beat the Redbirds by 10 earlier this season. Ohio State guard Jay Burson will be out for the rest of the season after suffering a neck injury in the game against Iowa last Monday. Burson was injured on this layup attempt, then was re-injured near the end of the ball game. Doctors say he has a cracked vertebra, but should make a full recovery. A visibly shaken coach Gary Williams had this reaction today. As a team, our concern right now is with um, Jay's ability to recover and just be able to go on with his life uh, once he's through the recovery period. Uh, it's good to hear that Jay will have, if things go well, the opportunity to play again because I think he's earned that level uh, with his play this year. He's, he's just raised his game as a coach, I thought, this year uh, to, a new, to a new level over uh, previous years. In Big 8 basketball last night, Oklahoma held its number one spot with an overtime victory at Kansas, 94-89. to Here's a little post-game reaction. It's hard to say uh, that you're pleased with the effort when you don't win the game. I mean, coach was still pleased with the effort, I think, but, uh, you know, it's just something about winning. If you just win by one point, it doesn't matter. That just makes everything seem so much better. Those kids fought their guts out. Uh, we ran out of bodies. Uh, but then again, yeah, I'm not trying to take any away from Oklahoma. I think they're a heck of a basketball team. We gave them a great shot. On the road, uh, I'll take 20 to 22 or something like that. I don't care what the score is. You just want to win. At home, we have to try to entertain people. We don't have to entertain anybody on the road, but just win. Ken Schrader and Terry Labonte were the winners in today's twin qualifying races for Sunday's Daytona 500. This is action coming up from the first race. Schrader took the checkered flag, but he had to avoid a multi-car accident in the process. This pileup on lap 17 set a number of drivers to the pits, including Rusty Wallace, Neil Bonnet, Ricky Rudd, and Kyle Petty. No serious injuries reported. The second race was run without incident. All right, thank you very much, Pete. The Lotto America jackpot is headed for a record $16 million this Saturday. No one picked all six numbers correctly in last night's drawing. And we'll be back with more news in just a moment. In national and world headlines, President Bush says the Soviet Union should stay out of Afghanistan now that its troop withdrawal is over. Meeting with a small group of reporters today in the Oval Office, the president said he hopes Afghanistan can come together with no more bloodbaths. But he did not endorse a Soviet plan that calls for an arms embargo and an immediate ceasefire in the troubled nation. The Bush administration also calling the death threats against a British author irresponsible and appalling. Muslim fundamentalists, including Iran's own Ayatollah Khomeini, are calling for the death of Salman Rushdie. His book, Satanic Verses, is considered blasphemous by the fundamentalists. And Wall Street had another gainer today. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was up 7.5 points. Average share of common up 6 cents. 177 million shares traded. New York gold was down $1 an ounce today. Silver was down a penny. Here in Iowa, the cattle market was steady and hogs were 50 cents to a dollar lower. Cash prices at Central Iowa elevators. Corn was 1 to 3 cents lower. Soybeans 9 to 12 cents lower. Honey? Lows tonight only near 10 above by tomorrow. Highs in the 20s, but a 30% chance of light snow continuing tomorrow night. Colder on Saturday. Right now, 21 degrees. Coming up later tonight on the TV8 News Live at 10, TV8's Todd Magel concludes his series of reports on former Iowans who have come home again. Tonight, a look at why two Knoxville men gave up life in Chicago and San Diego for life in rural Iowa. And that's our News at 6. Thank you for joining us.